Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mir Talk. My name is Kaeza Fern, and I am the Director of Communications at Mir. We're happy to see you. Glad to be getting together again. Today, we'll be hearing from our guest speaker, Tom Goro. Then after that, we'll have a question and discussion period with people from the wider Mir community. And after that, we'll open it up to, uh, to the audience for questions. Before we begin, I just want to update you about MIR. As you may already know, our projects are up and running in Freetown, Sierra Leone on private dwellings of families. And I just did want to mention that recently a storm in the area damaged the roof of a municipal building. And as a result of, of what has been going on in the area and the impact that MIR is having, we are actually in the process of installing new roofing with solar reflectors onto yet another building. If you are able to make a monthly donation, please go to mir.org forward slash donate. And we really thank you so much for your contributions that those of you are making. You also could write to community at mir.org to be in touch. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Tom Goro. Tom Goro, a biogeochemist, is president and founder of the Global Coral Reef Alliance. He has dived in coral reefs across the Caribbean, Pacific, Indian Ocean, and Southeast Asia for more than 60 years. He has published papers as well as written and edited books on scientific photography, marine ecosystem restoration, soil fertility restoration, and climate stabilization. He is co-inventor of the hotspot method for predicting coral bleaching from satellite data of the BioRock method for regenerating marine ecosystems and eroding coastlines. Tom was educated in Jamaican schools and holds degrees from MIT, Caltech, and Harvard. If anybody has any questions that come up while Tom is presenting, you can send them to Peter in the chat um, or myself, and we'll be really interested to hear what you have to say. Tom, thank you so much for being here. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, jump right into it and share my screen. Um, <clears throat> as I do that, I want to thank Mir for inviting me to talk. And since you didn't give a Mir introduction, I guess uh, Mir stands, you, you can explain what Mir stands for. It's an acronym for those who are new to this group. It stands for Mirrors for Earth's Energy Rebalancing. Uh, MIR, by the way, is a very important group because they're trying to address climate change directly by reducing heat, by making the, the insufferable houses that, that billions of people live in tolerable to live in, especially at night. So, I mean, they're, they're taking direct action, and that's uh, really fantastic. And I, I just do want to mention the latest, that Ye, uh, Ye is in Sierra Leone right now, in Freetown, and there's just been incredible stuff published in New Scientist about the success they're having there. And uh, so congratulations, you and the whole near team. Great. Okay. So um, let me just briefly, since there's a lot to cover, um, can you all see the screen entirely or is it? Okay, good. So I'm going to give a very quick overview of where we're going to go in case you run out of time, which is a good chance of that. So it's a lot to cover. So, I mean, I'm going to focus on coral reefs, but coral reefs are, the, as everyone knows, a canary in the mine in terms of global climate change. So the first thing is the bad news at first, I'll come to the good news hopefully later, is that coral reefs are the most vulnerable ecosystem of all to all forms of stress, and they just require the cleanest, purest conditions, so they're the first to go when things become bad. And they already passed their tipping point back in the 80s for coral bleaching. We, we've been you know, diving for a long time before that. We'd never seen large-scale bleaching due to high temperatures before the 80s. And since then, we have it essentially every year. It's killed, already killed most of the corals in the world, bleaching. I mean, we're killing them lots of other ways, but bleaching alone <clears throat> has done that. And the thing is that it's affecting coral reefs in places that we aren't destroying ourselves deliberately. So the pristine reefs, in some sense, are the worst affected. And so... It's a very serious situation. It is catastrophic already. 
And the next El Nino is going to kill many or most of what we have. There's not much that's going to survive the next decade. The, the current climate change goals are death sentence for them. I'll come back to that a little bit more later. And uh, without reversing climate change, corals are stuffed. I mean, just to put coral reefs are stuffed, not necessarily the species. I'll come back to that later. Now, because coral reefs are the most vulnerable ecosystem and the first to go, if we can save them, we'll save all the others. If we let coral reefs go, and that's that's what we're doing right now, it's, it's not an accident. It's a result of deliberate policy to protect the rights to profit off fossil fuels. But right now, we're letting them die. And they're not going to be the last ecosystem to disappear. Many more are going to follow. They're, just, they're a little less sensitive, that's all. Um, now, so that, that that's the bad news. I mean, really, we're, we're very close to the end for most reefs in most places. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about what I call biorock technology, which we invented in Jamaica, and that, that we call biorock electrotherapy, and it's actually using electricity to heal. That's very important to understand. I'll come back to that a little later, but it's really a life-enhancing technology that allows us to restore ecosystems. And it's the only method known that saves corals from severe bleaching. We keep them alive. They're just healthier, stronger. They have more biochemical energy as a result of the electrical field. We'll come back to that. But it's an electrical method. It regenerates all marine ecosystems that we've looked at. The biodiversity comes back by themselves because they settle, they grow faster, they're healthier. They resist environmental stresses that would normally kill them, high temperatures, mud or pollution. This is not just corals. It's all marine organisms we've looked at, animals and plants. Now, because we're able also to grow solid structures in the sea of any size or shape, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that later, um, we can grow reefs in front of severely eroded beaches that are growing corals or oysters or mussels, whatever's appropriate to that habitat. And the beaches grow back by themselves quickly when we grow back the natural protection for them. So that's one thing we've been doing for some decades. Um, and because we're growing solid limestone rock out of the sea, we can grow them at sea level rise. So this is something that won't be over top like any concrete or rock wall will be sooner or later. We also regenerate fisheries. We, we can be using this for sustainable whole ecosystem mariculture without external food being added. It will regenerate entire ecosystems that grow their own food. We can build islands, grow islands literally on shallow banks, and we can make floating islands in the sea. I mean, this is obviously you've got to provide buoyancy for that, but we, we build little floating reefs and that, that promotes all sorts of things. Uh, purifying water, et cetera, et cetera, fish, so forth. Um, the method greatly increases carbon sinks and sea grasses and salt marshes and sediments. And that's what we call blue carbon. In fact, that's the most cost-effective carbon sink we know in terms of the natural cycle of carbon. Um, we also can use this to produce building materials in the sea that are harder and cheaper than than Portland cement, and that absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere instead of producing. So that's, that's huge. So the result is that all of these advantages of this technology allow them to be the basis for an integrated and sustainable ocean economy. We hear people, lots of people talk about the blue economy, but hey, all the ecosystems near people are dying. Believe me, I've dived in them all my life. They're all dying where they're near people. So, you know, there's not going to be a blue economy unless we regenerate our natural marine resources. And right now we're killing them as fast as we can. That, that's a fact. So, so this, this allows us to turn the, this, this around. And it needs to be done on a very large scale because of what the situation we have with runaway global climate change. You know, it's not just the high temperatures that are going to kill reefs, it's sea level rise is going to wipe out all the low wilds and force billions of people out of their homes sooner or later on low-lying coasts. That, that's, you know, it's, it's extremely serious. Unless we reverse climate change essentially immediately almost, these areas are in real trouble. So reversing climate change is the key. Now, what we have is an interim technology only. The real long-term problem is to stabilize greenhouse gases at a safe level, which is pre-industrial. That, that's going to take at best, with the kinds of natural solutions we have, that could take thousands of years. They're just almost all too slow. That's the problem. And that's why direct action to cool the earth 
apart from the CO2 regulation mechanism, but to deal with the heat itself directly is, is really key. And that's actually missing from the global climate change treaties. They're all focused on CO2 as the only driving force, but anything that affects the redistribution of heat within the system is going to make a big impact on local temperatures. So we'll come back to that a little at the very end. And that's, that's why I'm a strong supporter of MIR. So that's, that's where we're going. The direct action is going to be essential. There's not, nothing else is going to make a difference in the long run. What we do is, is only short term. Now, I'm going to focus now a bit on reefs. And sorry, you know, I, I, I know many of you are not divers, but um, let me just say, I mean, the, the, the question we get all the time is why save reefs? You know, who cares? They're all going to die anyway. You know, why bother? You know, that's, that's, we get that question every talk. And um, so, you know, why save the planet? You know, the thing is that coral reefs are exceptional. They have something like a quarter to a third of all the species of fish in the sea and much less than 0.1% of the area of the ocean. So in terms of the biodiversity, the density of species, they're, they're hundreds of times higher than the ocean as a whole. So they're, they're oases in the desert. They're not like huge rainforests, little tiny spots on the edge of the ocean where the water is shallow enough for corals to grow in light and where the water is clean. So that, that's a very small area. Now, in terms of biomass and productivity, they're equally exceptional. They're hundreds of times above the ocean average. And so that makes them the most valuable ecosystems on Earth per unit area. And calculations by, by economists have shown that like 60% of all of the global economic losses of ecosystem services worldwide are due to coral reef degradation. Okay, so, so you know, 60% of the economic losses in an area that's just less than 0.1% of the ocean, you understand this is you know, 600 times more valuable than the average part of the earth, They're extremely valuable because of the ecosystem services that they provide fisheries, shore protection, sand, biodiversity, tourism, all of those things. That's why they're so valuable, but, but they don't provide anybody money. And that's why the money isn't destroying them. The money isn't in, in wiping them out and capitalizing the resource. And uh, that's what we're doing every place. That's why reefs are dying. So we're seeing those ecosystem services collapse because coral reefs create tropical beaches in the very islands themselves. When the reefs die, those beaches are going to wash away and the islands are going to flood sooner or later because coral reefs are constantly growing barrier. A dead reef doesn't provide that protection. It's being broken down, not so much by erosion of, of waves and storms. That's a big part of it. It's actually being riddled out from the inside by boring organisms. So sooner or later, it's going to collapse. So you need a, a live, healthy reef to provide that protection. <clears throat> And of course, all tropical islands, that's, that's our tourism are based on that in Jamaica, every place else. Now, corals are the most stress sensitive organisms of all. That's a fundamental biological fact. They require the cleanest water of any ecosystem. And the least change wipes them out. And we've killed most of them already. I mean, we've been doing it for a lot of reasons. I mean, mostly due to, besides global warming, is pollution with sewage and land-based sources of nutrients that cause algae to overgrow and kill them. I'll show you that in a second. And new diseases, which are almost all of land terrestrial origin. They're basically pathogens on land that have spread to the ocean or attacking marine organisms. So they're new. We didn't used to see them before. They really are new. And they're in every ecosystem, every group of organisms are being affected by these things. So we don't really know much what to do because we don't really know where they come from or how they're spreading. So the result is that coral reefs, most of them are really dead. You know, people advertise there's one coral here, another one a quarter mile away. They call that a coral reef, but most are gone. And this decade is going to wipe out most of them. It's the most vulnerable and beautiful ecosystem. And to understand that, you have to look at reefs really closely and for a really long time. Now, my grandfather invented close up macro photography. And he's also the first person to start photographing reefs to document the, their biodiversity. This is the first underwater macro photograph from 1948. Okay, And uh, so, you know, you have to look close up to really understand the, the beauty and the intricacy of this ecosystem. As my grandfather left and my father, and they're the ones who pioneered photographing coral reefs. And they pioneered it. This is my father in 1947, the Bikini Atoll. He's measuring the radioactivity of fish after the first bomb test. 
And that killed them at 45 from cancer. So, so we've been diving a long time before they were born see control devices, you know, it was way, way back. And um, let me just show you something of what we saw. This picture is 1954 in Ocho Rios, Jamaica. Now, that's my father and myself and my brother. And the reef we're looking at had been essentially flattened. All the branching crawls had been flattened three years before by a hurricane that took the roof off our house. And so, and this, this reef is one that's just kind of been, the branching crawls were shattered, but the large head crawls were going right up to the surface of the water and right up to the land. And my grandfather took this picture with a telephoto lens from the top of a 20 foot cliff overlooking this reef. Now, that's the important part. That cliff is made up entirely of dead fossil corals. And they're about 125,000 years old. And they grew the last time in Earth's history when temperatures were about one to two degrees C warmer than now. Okay, and at that time, sea level was about eight meters higher than it is today. So it's not movement of the land that's caused that, it's changes in the air. So a lot more ice had melted. Greenland had melted. Large parts of West Antarctica had melted at that point. Sea level was way up. And when you look at that fossil reef, it's all the same species of corals that we were seeing in the water there. Okay, now, and, and most of that reef, the corals are in position of growth, exactly where they grew 125,000 or more years ago. And then when you get near to the top, there's a thin mud layer. And above that, all the corals are broken, dead, smashed, and lying on their sides. And we think at that point, first of all, temperatures are about one to two degrees warmer than today. There were hippopotamuses and crocodiles in London, England at that time. Okay, that's that's you know, to give you a sense of what that means. And um Sea level was about 25 feet or eight meters higher. And CO2 was only about 280 parts per million. Okay, we're, we're you understand, we're way over 400 already. We've been, we're over more than 40% above the conditions that happened at that time. And I think that those corals actually died from bleaching in high temperatures and were flattened by super hurricanes or tsunamis. We don't know which. <laughs> they were literally physically destroyed, but they were already dead at that point. So anyway, so I, I, that so we can see a lot about the sensitivity of CO two. Once we had the CO two climate records from the Antarctic ice cores, we could then use this information about the fossil reefs to calculate the sensitivity of sea level and temperature to CO two, and it's many times higher than IPCC projects. That's, that's the other important part, is that IPCC's projections are model-based. They're not based on the real geological evidence of what happened, and they underestimate what the geological record shows is likely to happen. So it's much more sensitive to CO2 than we realize. All right, so this is 1954. And then I'm going to show you some pictures from 1957. This is the same reef. And these are actually the first photographs really ever taken documenting a reef. This is the first reef in the world to be studied by diving. Okay, be studied to systematically be photographed and described. Okay, and that's me when I'm six and my, my younger brother. And this, this reef, remember, had been flattened at this point six years before. The branching crawls have been pretty much all broken, dumped down, the big crawls survived. And this is a, a reef that's just recovering from a disaster. You can see the broken corals lying on the bottom, but they're growing back up. You can see that the dead corals are bright white limestone. There's no algae, there's no fuzz, there's no weeds or anything on them. These reefs would grow right back, keep growing even though they were broken. You can see a coral in the foreground that's kept growing after damage. So, anyway, so this, this is you know, what the reef looked like. You can see the dead corals, but the reef was just going right back up to the surface. In fact, in the background, you see where it's grown right up to the surface and you couldn't swim across that. So um, just to give you an idea. So um, these, these are, as I say, the first pictures that I can document. Now to go now, when I go back home, 
This is what it looks like. It's all covered with algae and weeds. Okay, the corals have died from high temperatures, but more they've been overgrown by weeds that we cause because we don't treat our sewage properly. And that's true everywhere in the world. We see this along every populated coast. There's weeds smothering what used to be beautiful and valuable ecosystems. Oh, this is what we see now. It's dead, and in most places, just smothered with weeds. Every now and then, <laughs> you, you, you find an isolated coral. You know, and we try to find those and nurture them and propagate them. We've been doing that since the first bleaching events, but it, this is really quite exceptional. Um, two years ago in Jamaica, we had two Category 5 hurricanes that hit after the hurricane season was over, like a month after it should have been over, Hurricane 8 and Iota. And they're both Category 5 hurricanes. And so we collected the fragments that were broken that we could find. And this is a biorock reef. And I'll share a bit more about that that we're propagating. So we we're trying to grow back the reefs that I knew as a boy, but it's a, it's a very difficult task. Um, so as I say, corals are just exceptionally vulnerable to stress. We've known that all along because of their fundamental biology. This is a, a diagram from my father's PhD thesis on the, you know, the biochemistry of corals. So we've known that all along. And we've warned people. This is the first review of coral reef ecology, systematic review published. And it was published in 1979. Now, we made the point, essentially, that coral reefs were super vulnerable and were not resilient to stress. Now, I will say it's a bit of an embarrassment, this article, because this statement here that coral reefs have more species than any other ecosystem on Earth is totally false. We did not write it. That was made up by the Scientific American editors. It's false, and it's an extreme embarrassment to us to have our name under, under what we know to be a lie. You know? uh, anyway, that's editorial license for you. Um, but anyhow, and, uh, just, just to point that out, uh, they're remarkable in every other. But the point of this paper is just showing how vulnerable coral reefs were. And this is before we had any real damage to reefs when this was published. We weren't seeing large-scale damage of reefs anywhere at that point. This is a, a diagram of global biodiversity, and this is a, a diagram my, my brother, who you saw in those pictures, made. And uh, it shows each major species of life on Earth whose size is proportional to the number of species. And the fact is, is Beetles alone, there are more beetles than everything else put together. So forests have the most species, not coral reefs. Okay, at, the, at the level of species, terrestrial ecosystems are much more biodiverse. But at the level of life forms, coral reefs have more different life forms of higher level organisms, if you want to say it, worms, clams, et cetera, et cetera, that don't occur on land. So in that sense, there are more complex ecosystem. It depends which sort of taxonomic level you look at. But anyway, the point is, they are the most diverse ecosystem in the sea, for sure. OK, now, so coral reefs, as I say, uh, began bleaching in the 1980s suddenly, very suddenly. We had no idea why it was happening. We very quickly realized there was temperatures, but it was such a small increase over what we were used to, we couldn't believe that they, they were really that sensitive, but they were. And research back, going back to 1919 and 1929, had found exactly that. That they said there were temperature limits that the corals would bleach above. People who, who found corals are heated up in tide pools at low tide and in full direct sunlight or bleach. They made measurements. They, they would have the water, which was very hot. They heated up corals in tanks, and they found about one degree C or so warming for about a month causes bleaching, and two degrees C kills them. And that's what we were seeing happen. We were getting about one degree in the summer warmer than the historical average temperatures. And we suddenly passed that threshold in the 80s. We hadn't passed it before. It was shocking how sudden that transition was and how it happened globally in all oceans. And it's just gotten worse and worse. I mean, as hot spots appear and disappear, we can predict them from satellites now. But the fact is, corals are the most sensitive ecosystem of all to high temperatures. And 
pristine reefs, as I mentioned, are worst affected because ones that, you know, in polluted areas, most of them are dead anyway. So, you know, they, they don't, there's not much left to bleach and die, but in, in the really pristine systems, you, I mean, I've dived in reefs that no one has ever dived in before. And some of these have up to 99% mortality and severe bleaching. It's just, just shocking. It's just you know, everything wiped out. Um, and there's no sanctuary from, from global warming. I mean, the old days we worried about hurricanes, but you know, if you went away from the area that was hit by the eye, those all healthy corals would go right back in and fill it, and that doesn't happen anymore. Okay, so if we lo lose our reefs, we're going to lose a lot more. Let's just leave it at that. They can't take any more temperature high temperature of pollution. The next El Nino is going to be a death sentence, and we're headed for climate overshoot because, you know, Quite apart from global sea level rise threatening people, but we're headed for climate overshoot. Uh, you know, we, we're headed that well it's for po political reasons and economic reasons, as we know. So, anyway, we, we want to save reefs because we want to save all the other ecosystems too. So, let me just leave it at that, but uh, definitely I want to save reefs. Um, international agreements are a death sentence for coral reefs because. When people say 1.5 is acceptable, no, no, it's not acceptable to coral reefs. That's the point. They left coral reefs out. And that's because the UN Convention on Climate Change does not protect the most climate sensitive ecosystems. It's not. I mean, and they don't have complete greenhouse gas accounting of all sources and sinks. So they can't possibly balance it anyway, even if they, you know, it, it's, it's a fake treaty in that sense. I know that because I helped write that treaty. I, I was senior scientific affairs officer for global climate change and biodiversity at the UN Center for Science and Technology for Development when that was dropped. And I put in all those things into the draft and governments just cut them out because they only wanted to account for the fossil fuels that they used. They didn't want any other carbon accounting. They, those are the numbers they had. They didn't want to have to do anything more. So the result is reefs are totally unprotected. And I, I briefed the small island states before the Rio de Janeiro Treaty was signed. I say, listen, you know, if you sign this, you're, you know, this, this is not in the interest of your people to sign this treaty. You know, you, 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 they were in a position to block the treaty because it's a consensus treaty, but they, they were bought off. They were told they'd lose their foreign aid if they didn't sign on and not to cause trouble and not impede stuff. And then what's happened since then is that every single meeting of the UN Climate Change Treaty has failed because the oil producing countries have blocked any agreement on limiting emissions or for real CO2 accounting or greenhouse gas accounting. And it's sort of a game. They, they ro rotate among the others who speak. You know, usually the Saudis and the Russians are not the ones who, who stand up first and, and demand this. They usually get Kuwait or Abu Dhabi or, 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 or Bahrain or Qatar to be the front guy, you know. But, but the point is, at every one of these meetings, the oil producing countries have blocked any consensus on dealing with the real issues of, of CO2. So, and that, that's why we're facing runaway warming. We knew now, it's 1989 that I, you know, yeah, and I, I, that I worked out how to predict coral bleaching from the satellite data. So we've known and shown there that it was those thing, but they refused to act on it. So the key thing is, is they're not really interested in protecting the most vulnerable ecosystems. They want to, you know, the. Countries that are in charge want their right to make every penny they can from killing the rest of the planet. So that, that's where we are. That's where we're headed for overshoot. So it's very serious. And with regard to bleaching, we, we really got it. I presented in 1990 evidence showing that high temperature was a cause of bleaching to the US Senate hearing with Al Gore and immediately attacked. They, they denied that there was any change in temperatures, denied that high temperatures caused bleaching. They denied that reefs were in decline. and they spent a great deal of money hiring people to say just those things. You know, oh, reefs are fine. There's no evidence of decline. Uh, high temperatures don't cause bleaching. It's, you know, whatever, whatever the fad of the moment was. And these people got huge amounts of money to obfuscate the issue and, and prevent it being happening because they did not want to deal with the CO2 issue, issue at all. That was the, the dynamite issue. And so our reports, our technical reports on this were banned by the White House by both Bush administrations, they prevented publication of, of, of the data. So, you know, anyway, so there's been deliberate delaying tactics on behalf of the fossil fuel industry because every country in the world, their energy industry writes their energy policy, whether they're rich or poor. And people are determined to prevent any interruption business as usual. And obviously, 
that's what's killing the planet. So, uh, and what, what has happened in the past, all I can say is that every time there's been runaway warming, for one reason or another, it's never been because of humans before, it was always a geological catastrophe that caused runaway warming, but we've had about four or five of them in the past. So every time that happened, coral reefs went extinct, and three or four million years later, they managed to re-evolve after the excess CO2 had eventually been purged out of the system, which typically takes you know, tens of thousands of years for the natural, I'm not gonna go into the carbon cycle issue here, but, but the point is, is it's happened to reefs before, and you know, it, it, they'll eventually survive. But, but the point is the ecosystems themselves are collapsing, not necessarily the species. This is also very important to realize. The ecosystem itself is that mass combination of them all that provides all these ecosystem services. What we're headed for is where we have isolated small corals and marginal environments that are barely surviving. The species will be able to survive, survive like that, but the ecosystem services we're, we're headed for losing very quickly. Uh, or unless we grow them in bio rock. And that, that's a solution I want to come to here. We use electricity to heal the ocean, I mentioned. And that's something that surprises people. You know, everyone is afraid of electricity, especially in salt water. They know that it makes your hair stand up straight and, uh, and then it kills you. So, you know, people are terrified of electricity in the water. And that's because it's high voltage, high current, high frequency, what they're terrified. That's, that's what they're exposed to. We're talking... What we use is extremely low voltage, extremely low current, zero frequency, direct current at what are basically natural levels. And for which organisms are adapted evolutionarily to tap energy from the water, the electrical currents created by the flow of water through the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so that generates the organisms, all organisms make their energy from small differences of voltage of about a tenth of a volt that drives a current through their membranes, and that's how they make their energy. If that voltage difference disappears, they die on the spot. You know, they, they run out of energy and die. On the other hand, we're in, in effect feeding them a level of environmental energy that keeps them at greater health. And I'll show you, you'll, you'll see what I mean there. It's really an astonishing discovery that we found by accident that we could not have predicted, but that, that's what we're seeing. So it, it and uh, let me let me just show you some examples here. So I call this bio rock electrotherapy. It's not like electrocuting, you know. It, it's really like an electro tickle or stimulation. And what we see is that it greatly increases settlement, the growth, the survival, the healing, and survival from extreme, you know, stresses, environmental stresses like high temperatures for every plant and animal we've looked at. We obviously can only look at some. Them. But what we able also finds it restores entire ecosystem biomass and biodiversity levels that are uh, higher than they were before, which is really, really astonishing and unexpected. And so we are able to keep ecosystem, marine ecosystems alive where they would die and regenerate them with no natural recovery. So let me let me just show you. I'm going to show you some pictures. First, actually, I got to say this was invented by an architect, Wolf Hilberts, to grow building materials in the sea. And he, he found that on the right conditions, he did it really slowly, not more than one or two centimeters a year, he could put electrical currents into the ocean. And on one term, you grow solid limestone rock. And his idea was to build walls and bricks and so on. Use the ocean as a mine in order to create building materials to use on land. And 80, 1987, I asked him to come to Jamaica and we started working growing corals. And uh, we worked for 20 years until he died and we grew about you know, built about 500 bio rock reefs in around 40 countries. Um, and you'll see some examples of, of what, what we did. So let me just, uh, you know, show you some pictures here. This is the material we grow. We build structures out of steel of any size or shape. They're completely protected from rusting by the electrical current. These are pieces, most of these pieces are, are about two years of growth from the Maldives. Okay. And we've hacksawed them out, you know, and you can see and this stuff is about two to three times harder than, than concrete, ordinary concrete. So it's tough stuff. Now, the, the piece up in the upper left is one of Wolf's original uh, samples. He grew that in, in Louisiana in the late 1970s. And when he came back three months later, it was completely covered with oysters that had grown to adult size. That's a piece of that. So it, 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 it's then, you know, we, we realized that it not only had structural properties, but also biological ones. 
Now, what we do is we build structure like reefs. Reefs are full of holes. That's how they live off that flow of water through them. That brings them the food and gets rid of the waste. And it prevents them being smashed by waves. The fact the water flows through them. It's not reflected. It's a reflection that causes the erosion and the damage. When the wave hits a solid wall and bounces back, that washes away all the sand in front and then under until the structure collapses. Where every seawall that's ever been built has collapsed or will. It focuses the energy right there. What reefs do is something else. They're open, porous, permeable frameworks that water goes through that dissipates the energy of the wave by, by completely different physical principles and also feeds the ecosystem. So that, that's what we're trying to regenerate is, is open framework structures. This is a four-year-old reef in Bali, for instance. And this was built in an area that had nothing there. It was just sand, a little bit of broken coral. The reef behind it had died from bleaching in 1998. I saw it happen about at least 95% and maybe closer to 99% of the corals there just died in a short period of time, bleached and died. So anyway, so this area was barren and uh, essentially no corals and no fish here. And this was you know, four years later after we did it. And it's another four-year-old reef in Bali and they you know, tracks the fish and all forms of marine life. A lot of these things settle spontaneously. And at this location, this is a set of pictures taken by UNJIM. And all these pictures were taken at one day at one site. Okay, and they just show only a very small proportion of the range of structures that we have. We have about 150 structures at this location, each of a different size and shape. So, you know, this is, you're only seeing a small part of it. But um, what we do is we, we transplant small naturally broken fragments of coral, you'll see that in a minute, onto these structures. And they grow like, like mad, but a lot of what you see here recruited by itself. It came by itself. Soft coral sponges, other things. So uh, you'll see that uh, you know, in, in a video coming up. So um, anyway, you get the idea. Uh, growing corals is what we do. And uh, this structure, this one just before here was done by an English artist called Celia Gregory, and we call this the goddess of the sea uh, for obvious reasons. And we have a lot of structures. This is in Bali, and in Bali, the Balinese are all artists, so they make incredible shapes here. This is a huge crab. And the reason you see people's names on it is because this has been done with no funding at all. We, we, we tourists get 15 euros and they get their name growing in limestone with their coral. They get a picture in the air. We've never had any funding for this. It's been done purely with, with local support. So um, anyway, so but, but the Balinese make fantastic structure. You're, you're not even seeing the most fantastic here, many, many based on Balinese mythology. So um, what happened after we grew those reefs in the barren sand in front of the dead reef is the reef itself sprang back by spontaneous settlement. This big round coral that you see in the center here was one of those that bleached and survived. But the rest of these ones, all these branching corals spontaneously settled and grew. And we went from, from about 1% live coral to about you know, close to 100 in, in about 10 years. So I'll show you a video now just to show you get some idea of the richness of these structures. Now, you see bubbles rising. That's hydrogen. We're making hydrogen by the same process by which the electricity makes limestone also makes hydrogen. We can't tap it because this is in the open ocean, but if you were doing this industrially, obviously you could trap that hydrogen. And if it's made by, you know, photosynthetic, yeah, by, by, you know, green energy, it's, it's clean hydrogen. Anyway, but what you see is the fish, you, the video is important. Here, what they're doing is they're finding naturally broken fragments. These are mostly small, irregular pieces. Um, the ones we, I pick are mostly a lot smaller and a lot more damaged. They're usually half dead because we pick them out of sand that they're broken off into. But what you'll see is that these little irregular fragments grow very quickly into incredibly perfect looking corals. I mean, they just grow very rapidly, but also they, they have a perfection of form that is, is really, truly exceptional. And it attracts huge schools of fish. And we had almost no fish when the reef was dead. We, we just keep getting more and more fish of more and more species in larger and larger numbers. So um, and we can, again, we can build any size or shape. Okay, I say this is this is just one location, a handful of what's there, but we can build structures to protect whole islands from sea level rise, regenerate their fisheries and their coral reefs and their biodiversity all at the same time. And that, that's why we're, we've developed this technology and what we're trying to do to regenerate reefs. So, um, and anyway, there are 
they're a pleasure to dive on, and you know we 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 feel good about growing corals. But what we're doing is a drop in the bucket because for every reef we save, a thousand are are dying. Now we'll also say that we've done this project with extremely cheap because we work without funding. We're using extremely cheap locally made battery chargers. They're no longer being made. So now we have a crisis. We no longer have the cheap battery chargers available. And uh, we, we really have a crisis. We've got to desperately raise funds to, to you know, upgrade our power supplies to more efficient ones that are, we can control in our data logging, which we know how to do. We just don't have any money. So, um, but anyhow, so right now the project is again threatened because of uh, you know, the inability to, to maintain our supplies that don't don't cost very much, but they were all we had. <laughs> um, again, the coral goddess. Yes. Now these these are structural importance of these. These are two bio rock. This so one bio rock reef. You can see a person here swimming in the water for scale, and this is just before and just after the two worst hurricanes in the Turks and Caicos Islands that came three days apart. They destroyed about 90% of the houses on, on the island were destroyed or, or damaged so people couldn't live in them. And uh, it's really interesting. It, it, this structure wasn't even welded together. We didn't have, have electricity. We, we hand bent the, the, the steel and we hand wired them together with, with, with uh, wire, literally. So, and it was just sitting on its own on the bottom, it was not attached to the bottom in any way. So. The hurricane waves went right through this without damaging it. Solid structures, you can see the solid blocks in the center, half of those were thrown completely out. They, nearby, there were artificial concrete reefs. Those caused so much erosion and scour around them that they literally sank into the sand and many of them disappeared. So they caused erosion, but in ours, the sand built up. The bottom rungs were buried in the sand. The sand built up. We lost almost no corals. We lost the electrical cable and the power supply. Those, those, you know, were carried away by the hurricane, and, and we never had the money to replace them. So, you know, we've never been able to get this fixed again. But, but the, the corals survived. They'd been transplanted from their only remaining snorkeling reef on Grand Turk that was being killed by, by propeller wash from the cruise lines. So, anyway, so anyway, um, unfortunately, that that one could not be maintained. Um, th this is Saint Barthélemy, also in the Caribbean. This reef is in about one and a half meters of waters, right where the waves break on top of the reef crest. And when Hurricane Irma category five came, we had no damage to the corals or the structure or the electrical cable where the waves were breaking, even though all the houses and hotels in the bay behind us, this reef, were, were, were destroyed. So, you know, that, that was pretty amazing. So, we're, you know, we're able to build Hurricane category five hurricane resistant structures. We think we can do this almost any place that it takes the right engineering. Obviously you've got to build strong enough for the waves, but um, you know, this is a bio rock reef in Indonesia that's 21 years old at the time it was photographed and survived two major bleaching events that devastated the natural reefs in the surrounding areas. And that bio rock is the only method known that increases survival from bleaching from high temperatures, the only method known because the corals are growing faster and healthier, that's all. So there's a million people out there trying to save reefs by breaking them and transplanting them, gluing them on. And when it gets too hot or too muddy or too polluted, they all die. I mean, these people mean well, but they're killing far more corals than they're actually propagating in most places. They'll be lucky for a few years and then an extreme event comes along and wham, they break them off, throw them away and start all over again. So that that's been the general story. I mean, we're really we protect them from bleaching. They they bleach, but they don't die. I mean, they don't. Some of them don't bleach at all. But anyway, it's the only method known, and that's why bio rock is an essential interim strategy to prevent reef extinction. We want to grow bio rock coral arcs in every coral country to preserve the species. We're not growing monoclonal assemblages like most of the, break, the breakers and the uh, gluers are. They're just mostly growing one weedy species. That's all they have left. We're trying to grow the entire biodiversity. And as I say, we get this tremendous spontaneous settlement. This is when we were laying the cables. This is a 10 year difference. It's the same area. This is just showing what would, and th these we didn't put, these were spontaneously settled corals were attracted by the electrical field. They love the cables for some reason. They, 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 you know, they must sense the magnetic field around it or something. But anyway, we don't, no one understands about physics or biochemistry, but this is why this was so unexpected. But the, the whole reef behind the structure popped back up and the eroded beach grew back that was behind on the shore. 
That beach was black volcanic sand and it was washing away. Now it's mostly white sand that comes from coralline algae that were growing in, in our bio rock reefs. So this is in the Maldives. This is a bio rock reef in 1998. It saved the entire reef from bleaching and it grew back the severely eroded beach behind when we began, they were piling sandbags and so that building was about to collapse into the water. So we're able to save reefs and grow back severely eroded beaches by regenerating the natural ecosystems in front of them. And that, that's, that's what we do. Now, um, let me just, I, I'll, I'll try to, I'm gonna wrap up fairly quickly. <clears throat> I do, do wanna say that other applications are blue carbon. Coastal sediments, especially salt marshes, sea grasses, and mangroves, bury about half the organic carbon in the ocean. They have half of the carbon in wetlands in the world or in marine wetlands. And that's more than the, the, the total amount of, of carbon in the entire biosphere or in the atmosphere. So they're really important. And we've destroyed half of the sea grasses, salt marshes, and mangroves. Of They're gone. We've de destroyed most of so we, we, All that stuff is all bleeding off of CO2 into the atmosphere. Coral reefs used to bury half the limestone in the ocean back when they were alive. Now that's no longer happening. Now, if we regenerate these ecosystems, blue carbon provides the most cost-effective land, oh, terrestrial, okay, biological carbon sink there is because you can bury the most carbon in the least area at the lowest cost by regenerating ecosystems that accumulate huge amounts of carbon and store it for thousands and thousands of years. In the case of limestone, millions of years, in the case of organic matter, typically thousands. But so this is regenerating these good systems, also regenerates the beaches, the shore protection, the fisheries, and the, and the biodiversity. Now, with regard to the, the blue carbon, what I'm going to show you a picture in a little second, but we regenerate underground growth and sediment carbon preservation at the same time. Um, whoops, sorry. Why is that happening there? Um, Okay, so these are, th this is seagrass we're growing in the Mediterranean, little patches, half a square meter with a solar panel, and it regenerated fish, mussels grew over, the roots grew so it's attached to bare rock. No one thought that was possible. The controls all washed away and died. But we were able to grow a whole little mini ecosystem there in a couple of months, just with a little trickle charge from a solar panel. This is a salt marsh in a former toxic waste Superfund site in New York City. They see the solar panel in the background and we're growing salt marsh. It's growing much faster, much taller, much greener. It flowers early, it has many more stems per stalk and it's built up the bottom. The mussels have you know, accumulated all around this salt marsh we're growing and literally built up the bottom this size. So this beach hur survived Hurricane Sandy when most of the other beaches in New York washed away. So, anyway, and so we're able to do that. So this is and store carbon. This, we're getting this to grow seaward, but all these salt marshes are eroding due, due to sea level rise. So it's a serious issue. Finally, bio rock materials. This is the material we grow slowly on the left a bar from the two years growth in the Maldives is two or three times harder than concrete. And on the right is a bag of stuff I grew that's very fast, and that makes a powder. It depends conditions under which you grow. You can produce a bunch of material. With that, we make bio rock cement. We grind that up, and this is a brick we made in Jamaica from that. It's a cement that absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. So, Portland cement produces about 10% of all the CO2. Every ton of cement produces a ton of CO2 in the atmosphere. These are carbon neutral or carbon negative building materials. They cost with solar power coming down to one cent a kilowatt hour. This stuff is far cheaper to produce than imported cement. It's harder. It doesn't require all the aggregate, 80% aggregate. That's another huge part of the CO2 budget that gets ignored. And you know, small islands can't afford to import Portland cement. They could be growing their own cement, making buildings that are reversing climate change, and they could be doing that from their own solar power and ocean energy. So we think that BioRock could replace Portland cement and turn a very significant carbon source into a very significant carbon sink. So that, that's one thing we, we hope happens, particularly in the in the atoll countries. So we're trying to develop projects in all the atoll countries. I've lived in every one of them. And they're they're on the front line. I don't know. I don't have time to talk about them now. But anyway, so the point is that bio rock 
electrotherapy allows to integrate sustainable economies in all coastal coasts, not just coral reefs. This is my point. In cold waters, we grow oyster reefs or mussel reefs. We can protect shorelines any place so we can make a structure that has, you know, strong enough to deal with the waves, regenerate biodiversity in every ecosystem we've looked at. So it has huge applications, floating islands, at open energy, blah, blah. This is a huge number of possibilities for regenerating, having a genuine blue, blue economy. Now, um, problem is, it's the only feasible interim solution we know until climate stabilizer is safer, but it's just not enough. That's the point. It's things, conditions are so out of hand due to the fact that we warned people 35 or 40 years ago that this was going to happen, and they all pretended it wasn't. So now, now all that lost time when something could have been done has been wasted. We're really heading for, for coral reefs for overshoot. So at this point, I think active climate intervention and temperature cycles is really essential. Just, just solving the CO2 problem, even though BioRock can help with blue carbon and you know, carbon negative building materials, that just can't be done quickly enough to save coral reefs. And that's why I think active efforts are really needed. So I just want to end here by pointing out just a couple things. I mean, mirrors, mirrors, direct cooling is one thing. People talk about clouds and regenerating Arctic ice. And I think you've, you've had people talk about that on mirror um, or will. Uh, it, I'm going to say something about forest transpiration just for one second, and then ocean thermodynamic geoengineering. And I hope you invite Jim Baird to, to make a presentation on that. But that's a method of basically making CO2 free energy by allowing heat to flow downward and rebalance the heat. It's a temporary solution because if it goes down to the deep sea a thousand years from now, it's going to come back up because the ocean turns over. So you do still have to deal with the CO2 issue, but it buys you the time and it pumps heat directly out of the surface ocean of them down. I, 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 Jim Baird is a guy to explain that. And uh, I mean, he's, he's here in the audience here. Please invite him to do that. It's, I, I just leave a sheet with some more background information. People want to look more deeply into it. And I, I want to thank you for giving me my ch a chance to talk here. But really, if we don't save reefs, and we're going to lose the islands and the coasts, and we're going to lose, we're, we're not going to have any blue economy anyplace. You know, that's what it boils down to. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. And those were incredible photos that you saw. I mean, that you showed that we saw. And I also did want to say, I'm sorry for the loss of your father. It sounds like he served, you know, the, he served the, the corals and um, in his experiments. So we'd like to bring on someone from the Freetown team who would like to ask a question. I know her Wi-Fi is a little bit spotty right now, so um, we're going to just just bring her on, um, and here we go. And this is Jalahan Sise, and Jalahan is a graduate from the University of Sierra Leone, Fora Bay College, with an honors in physics. She's also, like I said, a contributor to our Mir Cool Down Freetown team. So Jalahan, you can go ahead, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, hello, um, thank you for the very insightful presentation. I have a question for Dr. Tom. Um, and my question goes, um, is there evidence that blocking or limiting solar radiation during um, extreme periods uh, mitigate the worst effects of bleaching? Um, for example, um, using mirrors to reflect light away from the reefs. Um, what is your assessment um, of that? Yes, th thank you for that question. Yes, um, the thing is what causes bleaching is high temperature. But if there's high light at the same time, it gets much worse. So the temperature sets a limit uh, where the bleaching happens, but the rate of bleaching and the severity depends on light. So if you protect it, we saw in the first bleaching events that you know corals and caves or in shade or underneath weren't weren't bleaching. It was, it was very clear. We also saw that corals in muddy water didn't bleach. For instance, corals in polluted waters and ports and harbors with mud and, and sewage they pretty much survived the bleaching because they didn't also have light damage. It was, that was a kind of surprising thing. So, so yes, um, 
shading them definitely helps. Now it's very difficult to do in the ocean because you know floating a mirror or or a cloth above that um, is difficult to do. A number of people have tried. And I think generally speaking, it worked for a while until, until a big wave came along, carried carried it away. You know, so it's a difficult okay. thing to do. Uh, Ye and I are discussing trying to do that. We have a site in the Maldives or in Indonesia. We'd like to try doing that. Um, so, but but it's it's technically difficult just because you know the, the problem of waves. So there's not enough that has been done. But essentially you'd have to cover all the reefs, you know, that are exposed to light to do that. So that that's a very difficult task. Okay, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jala Han. And now, actually, I believe that Dr. Ye Tao is going to come on himself and speak with you a little bit. Hello, Tom. Uh, excellent presentation. Absolutely amazing uh, results. Uh, it's just quite surprising that we don't hear that in the mainstream media, like the you know, fantastic intervention that you developed. Uh, I have quite a few questions. I don't know how much time we can want to take, but uh, like for one, like uh, in the structures that you were able to make, there's a variety of morphologies and colors. So it seems like there's a great genetic diversity if the morphology were correlated. And you mentioned that there, uh, most of the coral reef's biomass has been wiped out. What about uh, genetic diversity? What's the fractional that's been, you know, have gone extinct? Maybe they're all still there, just in smaller biomass representation uh, quantities. Um, well, so I'm not. I'm sure I understand the question. Um, the, 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 can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, so yeah, it, it, the morpholo, morphology affects the. Um, so I'm wondering what fraction of the genetic diversity has been wiped out due to these warming well, I, events. Yeah, I, I, it's very, you know, there's very few species that have really gone extinct because they're always surviving in small isolated populations someplace that really isn't terribly healthy for them. So, you know, where people thought these species had gone extinct, then someone finds it someplace else, even if they're, they're rare. So I, I, I'm more worried about the ecosystem and the surface collapsing, the large scale surface collapsing than the species going extinct. I think that many will survive but not, you know, and eventually when conditions become good, they'll be able to grow. But that can't happen quickly. I mean, people say, hey, global warming, so you'll have reefs off New York. And the answer is, well, the reefs take thousands of years to grow, and the water's so polluted they couldn't grow there anyway. So, you know, um, hey, but every place we're seeing weeds. And, you know, a lot of times you hear people talk about coral recovery, and what, what's happening is it's, it's a single species of weed that's spread. You know, it's abundant, it's nice to see, uh, all that sort of thing. But the biodiversity has collapsed in many places. I mean, the species hopefully are someplace. But in almost every place, the local biodiversity is, is really down. I mean, it's thing after thing that we used to see, and we haven't seen in decades. Or we go someplace else and say, oh, wait, we used to have those too, you know? <laughs> no, anyway. uh, the, the most important of all, though, are the branching corals, the open branching corals, because they have the highest surface area for absorbing wave energy best habitat for fish and all that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, in many places, those, those are the first to go. You know, what we're having left are, are corals that don't serve the same ecological function coming back, where we, where they are coming back. Uh, well, okay, thanks. I think it's quite encouraging, actually, it's a silver lining that uh, at least uh, the genetics, the DNA are still there. You know, if we uh, could scale your, your technology quickly and, uh, you know, affordably, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, there's a chance to recover the surface there, and you demonstrated, well, you know, within years, it's still possible. Yeah, so I, um, I, I think we can propagate that. I, I don't think we can get them to evolve quickly enough. I mean, that I, I sort of interrupt you, but I mean, the thing is, in the past, the corals that exist now actually are descendants of corals that lived when it was much warmer than it is now. Back in Miocene days, for instance, you know, places where it was 10 or 15 degrees so you're warmer. But what happens when the ice ages began, the high temperature corals all went extinct. And the ones that survived were the ones that are adapted to, to low temperatures at the beginning of the ice age. So those are the ones we're stuck with. So, you know, and potentially they have the possibility to re-evolve, but that that would probably take millions of years. You know? Well, maybe hopefully not that long. But anyway, it, it's uh we're just going to have to keep them as alive as we can and not, not count on miracles or super corals or anything else like that. We're just going to have to do active restoration, just like we've got to actively change temperature, in my view. 
Okay. Uh, the technology, like what's the um, energy cost for, uh, per square meter? Let's say if you were to do a, just a crossbar mm. pattern uh, oh. to grow. Yeah. Well, mm, well that, you, you usually were thinking not of per square meter, but of length of coastline or protecting. See, corals are usually on slopes and they're usually linear ecosystems. So I tend to think of length. But um, I mean, just to give an example, I mean, the cases where we've grown back, say, a couple hundred meters of beach um, and reefs in all along in front of that. Um, that have regenerated sea grasses and corals and new sand production, all that sort of thing. And the beaches grew back. And for those, we're typically might be using about as much electricity as, say, two, three, or four air conditioners. And that's, but those are, we're using extremely inefficient chargers, though. You know, they're wasting half the energy that goes into them. But, but I mean, so in other words, we can grow back a beach and a reef for less money than it costs for the beach lighting in a hotel. Okay, so so basically the operation is, is continuous because you need a DC uh, current. Yes, uh, yeah. I, I I assume the uh, there's some like uh, you know kinetics for the, the the thickness to grow. Maybe it's initially it's faster because the resistance you know bit from the metal rod to where your active you know, interface it is. It keeps, it keeps going. I mean, I've, I've grown yes. stuff like this about this big around and rock hard. You know, in the Maldives for around a one millimeter wire. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is, is it? Uh, more or less it uh, linear. Oh, sorry. So is the growth rate the linear? The, is the well, in the I, I, in have, we haven't measured, but it just it just keeps growing as long as you apply the current. I mean, it it grows faster at first when it's on bare metal, but the, okay. the thing is, in fact, that the the chemical reactions happening at the metal surface, and hmm. so in fact, water is circulating through that. There's, there's a some degree of porosity and permeability. The hydrogen bubbles you see are coming right from the metal. But presumably, once the first layer of rock forms, uh, it's not that layer it becomes stationary, right? And it's uh, the growth should be happening at the interface of the newly formed yeah. rock, and then well, not, so not, there not, must not, be some. Not not exactly. I mean, it, see, it grows out sort of like tree rings, but in fact, it, it's there's a, a porous framework of of pores that allow water to reach the metal and and and, and let hydrogen flow out. It's it's a it's a pretty dynamic material. It's constantly remolding itself. So it's hmm. it's it's a, uh, it's a growing material, and it's, it's okay. really unusual. And and it, it all you know, it, depending on the rate, we can produce extremely hard material or soft material that we can make cements with. So there's there's a, a hmm. wide depending on the conditions we do it under. Now um, those applications would probably each species no doubt has a different preference we don't know what those are yet i mean what we find is enormous amounts of some species coming in often we're happy about it some we're not because some things just overgrow everything else you know or uh, can mm. so um yeah but anyway um presumably they're, they're, they have different preference. we just don't really know at this point i see i could imagine you know if you want to scale up this thing you could uh, do the initial growth in some um field cavity where you also harvest the hydrogen that you, you mentioned is bubbling up. So that could uh, potentially partially, you know, recover well, some well, of the electrocatalytic energy. Yeah, you okay, could elect do electrolysis energy. You could do that in a facility where you're growing the minerals and mm -hmm. producing things at the same time and able to trap them. But you you know, if you're trying to grow ecosystems, you, you can't easily trap it in the sea because you want the water movement and the light. Yeah. So well, our focus I guess there's... is on yeah, a, but but definitely yeah. there are large scale industrial applications that could result, particularly in tropical countries. Obviously, the warmer and the wetter it is, the better. I mean, so the, the warmer and saltier it is, the better it is. So this is really a tropical technology. I do also want to mention, sorry, that the one thing you, you pointed out, yay, sorry, I, I, I meant to thank you for that, is pointing out, well, you've got to keep the current on. And that's right. As long as the current is on, and these things are, are damaged, say a boat runs into them and cracks off the, the, the uh, limestone, it'll grow back. The damaged area will heal first. So that, that it has that dynamic property. Also, the he increased health of the corals and the marine organisms is a function of the electricity. Okay, if you cut it off, it doesn't have that benefit. And to give that example, that reef I showed you in the Maldives, that picture was taken 16 years after we grew that reef. The Asian tsunami passed right over that island, over that beach, and over that reef, and didn't damage it. <laughs> I mean, mm. Our friend was washed off the island; had to swim back. Okay, who <laughs> helped us build it? So, um, so it, it really 
was, but it only had power for about two years. That piece I showed you, you know, this was for about two. Then, then they shut it off. They, they, they had the only tourist snorkeling reef left in the Maldives. Everything else had died. They had the beach back. And they said, ah, well, we'll just cut the power off. We don't need it anymore. So they cut the power off after about two and a half years. And um, they did fine. There was no bleaching for 18 years. And when a serious bleaching event hit, 98% of them died. They were no longer protected by the electricity. So, they, they, mm. so maintenance is an issue. And I think the, the point is, is with sea level rise being out of control, we're, we're going to, I mean, again, no one's really taking that very seriously, but people are going to have to start abandoning the coast or desperately building structures. And the point is that present technology of coastal protection is all a failure. All, every seawall causes erosion, <laughs> you know, in mm. front of it and will fall down. So what we do is the opposite. We, we tr create sediments and trap them and protect them by regenerating the ecosystem so and the ecosystem mm -hmm. so that, that's what we want to see done and that that's every coastline needs that i mean every major city along the coast is going to flood soon i mean we mm -hmm. don't need to mention names but probably where many of you are is going to be underwater you know in in uh, the next generation <laughs> maybe sooner <laughs> mm -hmm. all right thanks tom i will uh you know leave the rest of the time to the many members of the audience who are eager to ask questions. Very excellent work. Thanks. Yes, so we can open it up for if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat to myself or Peter Dines. Um, I'm curious, Tom, you know, as you go about your your life, when you talk about these things, are do you find that people are surprised at what you you know what you say? Do you feel do you feel like people have an understanding that so much has already been lost? Well, you know, you know, the thing is that there are no there are no coral scientists, almost no coral scientists working now ever saw a pristine reef. So that that you know, so they get very excited about stuff that that really is. Is not very good. Um, so you know it, it is disappointing. I mean, I will say that that you know in Jamaica we identified every form of stress to reefs before anywhere else. We told people what was happening and why it was happening, what could be done, and people only cared about making money from destroying it. that reef that we dived on that I showed you in those first pictures. I didn't mention this. A few years after those pictures were taken, that reef was turned into landfill that now sits underneath the hotels in the Ocho Rios tourist area. So that's the economic value of reefs is landfill. People make millions off that and still do. You know, the fishermen lost their resources, but, you know, they were poor anyway. So, you know, that the, the economic balance, money was made from destroying the environment. I mean, mm -hmm. that that's, that's a sad reality. And every place in the world I go, People are destroying their coastal habitats as fast as they possibly can find the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And people admire them because of the money they make from doing that. So that that that's, you know, pe people don't follow your reefs, I'm afraid. I mean, Jamaica, we didn't. We, we warned everybody. We warned everyone else in other parts of the world, and no one was listening. Mm. Mm. Such a shame. Well, I have a question here from Marina, who's asking... Are there specific people or groups that listeners and audience should be aware of in countries who lack access to bio rock coral arcs who would most benefit from this intervention? Oh, well, well thanks, Marina. Um, that's my daughter, by the way. Um, oh. but, yes. Um, uh, the, the, the answer is that's very hard to reach people. The thing is, we we work without money and without publicity. We we're, we're just we try to work in the field with local groups that have environmental management. We don't work top down. The top down projects all fail as soon as the money dries up. So the point is, the local people aren't there growing back and protecting their environment for their own long term future. It's not going to work. That that's not easy to find. So, and the funding is all going to the top-down stuff. It's going, it's going to, you know, people who spend the money they make on publicity and Hollywood starlets and, you know, about 
making TV ads and and fancy offices and jet setting and all that stuff. So you know that that that's not how we work. So people don't hear about us unless they look very very hard because. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of people breaking corals and hanging them up and watching them die and then breaking off another batch and so forth. And they mean well, but but the fact is it's just not working very well. And but but there is no money going to communities to help them regenerate and manage their own resources. That's the key. It's a top-down stuff by people who who want to capitalize off the resource and make money for it, not not people who value the long term ecosystem services that that's right. it's a, a, a mindset problem we have in every country of the world mm -hmm, every, mm -hmm. every country of the world yeah it seems to be a global cultural crisis or yeah um i have a question from rebecca and she's asking are there any bio rock installations in cold water regions that are tidal and also where on earth would be the potential potentially most beneficial place if for instance the military were to take on the project of protecting coral reefs so it's kind oh, well, of a two, two part okay. well, question well, yeah okay well well i, I think the answer to that is we can work in any ecosystem. We, we've done a lot of projects growing oysters, for instance, in that site in New York City, we grew oysters about eight times faster in length and also in width and also thickness with 100% survival that we kept growing all winter long with electricity. They never went dormant. They never went dormant, whereas the controls, almost all of them died and the ones that survived shrank because their shells dissolved in cold water. So we can make enormous differences with oyster and mussel reefs that, that are the equivalent of coral reefs in cold water. So whatever the natural ecosystem is that you would find on hard bottoms, we're, we're, we're going to stimulate. And we, you know, each place is going to be a different suite of organisms, but it's going to help regenerate what was originally there um, and maybe some things weren't, you know, the things are changing so quickly, the new immigrants and all that coming in, and some things are going to benefit more than others. But we're, we're pretty sure we can benefit any ecosystem. There are lots of variety. I mean, for instance, in the Bahamas, we made floating bio rock reefs in a canal, and we were growing not corals, we were growing sponges and clams and hydroids and filter feeding organisms to try to clean the water up in the canal, you know. So we, we can work in any marine ecosystem that's salty. We can't work in fresh water because the electricity needs salt water to flow. <laughs> right, right. So there, there are many possibilities. We, we've only explored a handful of them. I mean, I, we, we work wherever the opportunity arises. And uh, since there's no funding in this field, basically people come to us, they say, we have a problem, can you help us? We say, sure, you know, send us a ticket and give us a bed. Um, but, but um, you know, most of them don't have that. And so, that, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> Okay. Um, Von Larson's got his hand up. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Okay, I can, um, let's see if we can unmute. And we'll let you. Okay, can you click your, click the button? Okay, you you know. I will yeah, make you. Okay. I have several questions. Has this been recorded? Yes, we are recording this. I think this is, I've known Tom for maybe 10 years and heard four or five talks like this. And Tom, this is by far the best. I, I think it's because it's the longest. So <laughs> I really, I think you did a wonderful talk. Uh, 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 Tom knows that I'm about to talk about biochar, but I want to introduce it through the word seagrass. You mentioned seagrass. Uh, do you have any numerical data on the accelerated growth of, of seagrasses no data yet no 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 i i have a short video like a two-minute video of a project in the bahamas and what you see is the seagrass is much taller right around it and uh, you know the fish are all cramming into it and all that sort of thing that we've seen in panama and other places but these projects, you know, as I say, we, we don't have funding. We don't have labs or equipment or, or instruments. So our only tools are our eyes and our brains. So, so you know, but I don't have, I didn't have a camera in, in that. I just had that one video in the Bahamas. So we have no measurements, but basically the seagrass seem to grow about roughly about twice as tall around them. And in Indonesia and other places, we tend to see seagrass growing towards the reefs 
But we so, get a huge increase too, is, is the, the sand producing algae, the, the good algae, the ones that make beach sand. And of course, I want to go from sea grasses to sea weeds, but yeah. <laughs> if emphasis for, for what you're doing was on sea grasses, would it, would it almost certainly help coral? It, they're, they're not in any conflict, are they? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, the thing is that they're, how, how can I say, they're, they're symbiotic ecosystems, mangroves, sea grasses, and, and corals, reefs. So because they're often in close spatial proximity to each other, but, but the point is that many organisms depend on all of them. I mean, just let me give, an, I mean, just, just a single example. The seaweeds, for instance, I spent a lot of time growing seaweeds in Jamaica, okay, a lot of time. Uh, we'd get baby lobsters, you know, like this big, settling in, in, in huge amounts into that. But normally they go into the mangroves. So the mangroves are essential for the little baby or lobsters. And then when they get about this big, they migrate out into the seagrass. And that's when the fish eat them because they have no place to hide. And they get a little bigger, they go out into the reef. When they get really big, they go to the bottom of the reef. So they, they require at some stage in their life cycle all of those things. Now, when we grow biorock habitat for lobsters, we can get hundreds of lobsters in a few square meters because we're creating the kind of hiding space they're looking for. That limits their population. There's only you know, so many holes of the right size and shape for lobsters that they can hide from fish, especially in the stage in the seagrass. So if we build the right habitat for them at each stage of their life cycle, we can potentially greatly increase the population. We're, we're trying to do that. We began doing this in Jamaica. The next place we worked is in Panama. That's, that's my second country. My mother's Panamanian, was the first Panamanian marine scientist. And uh, we work with the Kuna Indians who live on islands that are flooding from sea level rise and they're having to abandon their islands right now. They're, they're master divers and they live off harvesting lobsters and the lobsters are vanishing. So we've been trying, been trying, you know, for more than 25 years to be working with them, building solar powered lobster habitat, regenerating their reefs, but you know, there's never been any funding. Just one last question. Uh Lots of money, of course, for carbon dioxide removal now in the last few years. Is there any federal or international money available for coral? Well, uh, it depends who you ask. There's a lot of people giving it away to, to, to the people who spend it on PR. Let's put it that way. I mean, there, there are a bunch of people who claim to be saving lease. In my view, their waste, their money is being thrown away. Uh, but definitely the stuff we do is not being funded. It's definitely beyond the pen. Part of that is because our technology was a technology that was invented and developed in small island developing states by and for small island people. And what we find is that, you know, this is a technology that's applicable everywhere in the world. We're happy to give our technology to the rich countries, but they want to sell it back to us. They want to claim that they invented it and charge us for the privilege of using, you know, there's been no funding to support it because the funding is for what I call tourist science, where people jet set in and they have a little fun in the sun, they go out, they plant a coral here or there. But without the local people, being affected and transforming their resources is not going to have any real impact. But that's where we try to work with the fishermen and the, the local communities that are allowed to manage their resource. In most places, they're not, by the way. I mean, most places, local fishermen have no say over what happens to their environment. Well, again, I, I, I'm done, but I, again, I congratulate you. I, I thought this was your, by far the most uh, informative talk that I've heard you give. Thanks. Thank you, Ronald. So we do have a couple more questions, if you are willing, um, Tom. Sure, sure. No, I, I can. I'm happy to stay as long as people can stand it. That's okay, no problem. Okay, there are a few more questions coming in. So here's another question from somebody else um, at the in the Freetown team from Kona. Considering the intricate biodiversity within coral reefs, could you please explain the specific ecological interactions and dependencies within different species within a coral reef ecosystem, including both direct and indirect relationships and how they contribute to the overall health and resilience of the reef? I'm imagining it's somewhat complex. Well, that, that's a question that would take a year to answer. All, right. in, 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 I, mean, that, I think the, the point about coral reefs is the secret for their exceptional diversity, productivity, and biomass in the most nutrient-poor waters of the earth. 
<laughs> they live in the deserts of the ocean. High nutrients kill them. High nutrients stimulate algae that smother and kill them. That's why every populated coastline, the reefs are dying because of algae. So they're, they're, they had this adaptation to very pure and perfect conditions that, that we're no longer providing. So that, that's, that's their limitation. Mm -hmm. They're very fussy. They're not resilient at all. Now, what's happened is that they're, they're, the people who get money from the coral reef people, the people say, oh, we're resilient managers. We'll manage our reefs in a resilient way. Okay, corals are not resilient. They're extremely vulnerable. You've got to cut the stresses out. It's that simple, you know. But anyway, that fiction was is political fiction. We saw tremendous politics. People were, were paid to say, oh, well, resilience is the answer. We'll manage our resilient reefs. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in the Florida Keys National Park, they boast about how resilient their, their management is, you know, and uh, it, it's a game to get more money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, we had a, a question that came in about just, are there are there any projects in the Philippines currently that you know of? Well, there are none now. No, I, I've dived in every major island of the Philippines except for Samar and Leyte, okay? And, and I've dived all up and down. And, um, and Philippine reefs were like Indonesia. They were the most incredible in the world in biodiversity. But, you know, it depends who you ask, whether it's 95 or 98 or 99 percent were bombed to pieces by fishermen. And most places you go, all you see is a pile of rubble. And um, the Philippines has been massive problems from I mean, the forests have all been cut down. The soil is all washed into the sea. There's, there's no sewage treatment in, except in, in extreme high-end luxury hotels. And even there, there, there that, that's not, not much of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, they're, they're in very serious condition. Now, I've, I've done a lot of Baroque projects in the Philippines, and unfortunately, none were maintained for one different local reason or another. Okay, we worked with some really good people in, in, in Negros Occidental. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the person who we worked with was so good, he got hired by, by the German Technical Aid Agency at, at 10 times the salary that the Filipinos could afford to pay him because this guy was really good. And the person replaced uh, everything collapsed. You know, So sometimes you're very dependent on... on on having some, you have to have every place, someone whose local is really committed to their environment. If they leave, it's a big problem if there's only one person. So these, these parts are pretty vulnerable. It's not, there's not a lot of people who work on this. So we have a, a limited pool of people in most places, but the, the key thing is, is to stimulate local, local management every right. place and, and give them the tools to be able to regenerate what, what the local people have. Mm -hmm. And most places, they're just not being given the tools at all for that. Yeah. For true ecosystem regeneration. And that's that's what we need in every habitat. Yeah. Well, that leads into maybe to a, a, a last question. It's from Tom. You express a lot of frustration about the lack of funding for these projects. What might be your best projects in terms of raising, pro, sorry, prospects? What might be your best prospects in terms of raising money to support this work? And how can the rest of us help with these efforts? Because it is so important. Oh, wow. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it's very hard to get information out about this, as I say. You know, people, it's, People don't really want to listen that much about the subject. Mm. They think it's a lost cause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it is. I mean, you know, my daughters are too smart to go into a dead and dying field, you know. <laughs> oh. Well, we are grateful that you are in this field and doing the work that you're doing and hopeful that, you know, Mir can collaborate with you in some way to with the efforts that you're making. So... We want to thank you so much for being here today and sharing your wisdom and your experience and your incredible photos and video. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So here at MIR, we are working to educate and also helping to develop a solution for the warming of the planet. So we invite you to keep visiting our website and Twitter, Facebook pages, our YouTube channel, which will have the recording of this talk in case you missed any of it. We'd like to tell you 
about our next Mir talk, which is going to be Sunday, July 2nd. It will feature Jem Bendel in a talk entitled Breaking Together, a Freedom-Loving Response to Collapse. So keep your eye out for that. And if you can make a donation, we encourage you to go to mir.org forward slash donate to help with our efforts. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us today and wishing you well. Bye for now.